Right. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, meeting of the Excuse Me Committee here in the Civic Centre in Leyland in Lancashire. Uh, I want to welcome this meeting, um, the committee members on the panel and uh, the officers supporting us this evening. Um, this is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available on the council website. Some housekeeping for those in the Civic Centre. No fire drills are planned and if the alarm goes off, please leave by the emergency exits at the back of the room and congregate on the car park. Please turn mobile phones off and switch your microphones off when not speaking, if I can emphasise that, because as I said last week, uh, and it is easy to happen, you, you ask a question, you leave your microphone on, and all the members of the public see is you not saying anything and don't see the people talking. So if we can get into that habit, that would be great. For those, for those of us joining us on Microsoft Teams, welcome Councillor Hancock. Please remain muted and indicate at the appropriate time when you would like to speak and I will bring you in. We will now move into the agenda. Do we have apologies for absence? Uh, Chair, we've got apologies from Councillor Will Adams, Councillor Julie Buttery, Councillor Matt Trafford, Councillor Mal Donohoe and Councillor Lomax is with us tonight substituting for Councillor Trafford. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Declarations of interest. Members are reminded to declare any interests that they might have. Moving on to item three, minutes of the last meeting on Tuesday the 11th of October. Members are asked to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Any comments? Can we approve those minutes? Can I have a proposer? And a seconder? Kath? Sorry. Uh, can we have a vote on that? It's Don't need to vote. Okay, sorry. Apologies. <coughs> That's great. Okay. Okay. Um, item five. Matters arising from the previous scrutiny committee meeting. Do we have any matters arising, please? No. Okay. Moving on to item Item four, minutes of the scrutiny budget and performance panel meeting on the 14th of October 2022. Sorry, members are asked to note the minutes of that meeting. Okay. I've covered off matters arising from the previous scrutiny committee meeting. I'll take any questions now. Councillor Green. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, th there's obviously... Um, looking at the update on the recommendations, there's still a vast number of recommendations which have been accepted, but they're not implemented by this council. Um, however, looking at that long list, there are a small number of them that we can possibly remove this evening. So, we'll be to um, consider that as a committee. Okay, I think we can uh, remove them. I'll just take a question from Councillor Unsworth, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just on um, page 14.56.4, where it says about, it does say that it's been implemented um, and there is a list of <coughs> cooperatives that can be accessed through the link that's on there. However, I couldn't find a way of um, sorting them into local authorities. So I wonder if that could say on, even though it says yes, yes. Yes, we'll provide that. Thank you for that comment, uh, Councillor Unsworth. Any other further questions from the councillors? No. Okay, I've now just one second, sorry. Uh, uh, Councillor Coulton? Uh, the list of recommendations seems to be ever growing. You know, is that a, a cause for concern? You know, there are some being dropping off, but it seems to be very slow, the drop-off rate. Yeah, um, well, they'll stay on the list until we're satisfied that those items were completed. And I think there are a couple of items that we can close that we agreed in the pre-meeting. And that Darren will, will take that action to do that. Um, it's a 
very subjective question, really. I'm not really sure how to answer it. Um, I think we just have to take each action uh, that's outstanding and come up with whether or not, you know, you need to be perhaps more specific, Colin, about... All I'm implying is that should the, whoever it, the, is responsible for that item, this should be more of them being completed by whoever. I don't understand what I mean. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just really to mention, this is a tracking sheet for the scrutiny committee, just to make sure um, nothing gets lost or uh, missed. Um, you'll notice the vast majority of recommendations are either from the last meeting or the July meeting, so that's quite recent, really. And I think it's more a testament to your recommendations, really, um, that they are quite involved and do need work and timescales. So I think it's a case of um, accepting they're, they're on this list and the scrutiny committee has just been happy that you're giving up that giving updates regularly and that people are taking these seriously if there are any that are causing you some concern for example council walton mentioned earlier the first one around the review of commercialization of the civic center and um, then we can take that away and look at that so i think it's just flagging up any individuals that might be concerned but i think generally um this is a good way for the screening committee to keep track of them that helps Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you. Nevertheless, I do share Councillor Kilton's concerns. I, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah, some are relatively recent, but, but there's eight on here, um, of which six of them have still not been implemented uh, that are more than six months ago, and, and in some cases over two years ago. Sorry, over three years ago. Um, and that does cause concern um, for, for Council as, as we proceed on a journey um, looking towards the Council becoming excellent and that doesn't show the Council in a good light. So hopefully those can be picked up. Um, just happy for the ones that have been implemented to be removed from the list, but just one query. So um, minute 56.6 is the one where individual members are going to uh, raise the point that we had a concern about as a scrutiny committee with the uh, county pension fund. I think on the basis that they're given the assurance that they're going to do that, I personally am content for that one to be removed from the list, just so that we get the number down somewhat, so we can focus on the ones which are genuinely outstanding. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Green. I think we... Didn't we decide to take off the next one as well, 57.3? Isn't that, uh, it's very difficult thing to the ASBs. No? Someone help me out. No. Okay. We'll leave that on, sorry, everybody. Okay. <laughs> sorry, Karen. Uh, Councillor Walton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just minute 4.4 uh, 4, um, that we, uh, sorry, 36.2 uh, that we said that we would um, take it off because it's about the transformation strategy and we did yeah. have a member session that Vicky did in um, October. Yeah. So we would take that one away. But yes, anyway. Okay, any further comments on the uh, action sheet? Oh, okay. Okay, we'll now move on to item six, a staff survey 2021. This item will be presented by uh, the Director of Change and Delivery, Vicky Willett. Um, and as I say, everyone, if you can just remember to turn your microphones off when you've asked your questions, uh, then the uh, YouTube video, sh video shows the speaker. So I would like to invite uh, Vicky to introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. So I'll just briefly cover off the uh, report. Um, so this report covers the staff survey that was completed in November and December 2021. So almost 12 months ago now. Um, it was one of the most comprehensive staff surveys that we've undertaken here in some time. Um, you can see the full results in the appendix and the breakdown of the questions as well. 
it was undertaken in a period of significant sort of instability and uncertainty as we were recovering from the pandemic. We'd recently returned to the workplace and we're getting to grips with new ways of working and understanding how we would work remotely and with new types of technology. But that said, we've done a lot of work since then to embed those processes within the way that we work generally. And we all know that that's become part of day-to-day -day life now in the way that we interact. So the report sets out some of the findings um, in the tables at point nine and point 10, summarising areas of higher satisfaction, including satisfaction with line management, working alongside the team, the priorities of the council, and the role that individuals play in the success of the council. And then at point 10, some of the areas of lower satisfaction around managing change, communication, and the culture of the organisation. In response to the findings, we've undertaken a, a significant amount of work, as I said. One of the first things that we did was develop a staff survey action plan, and that was a very short-term plan to respond quickly to some of the key themes and to demonstrate to staff that we really wanted to get on top of some of those issues that had been identified. And I should highlight that throughout the action, the emphasis has been on a, an inclusive and collective approach to addressing some of the challenges that were highlighted because as a group, of, as a workforce, we all have a role to play in our own happiness and satisfaction and ability to contribute on a day-to-day -day basis. So it has been a very inclusive approach. We've been asking for staff feedback and involvement throughout. But a few of the, the, the early points were things that we needed to act upon straight away. So we developed a short-term action plan with five key objectives around consistent leadership and management, making sure that senior leaders were visible, improving staff engagement and internal communications, supporting new ways of working and employee-led interventions. So there are some actions there included, things like um, providing clear structures for one-to-one -one meetings, making sure that as we return to the offices, the senior management team, the directors and managers were visible around the buildings and the offices and making use of teams to keep in contact with their services and their managers and then reviewing our internal communications through a range of channels to make sure that we were reaching all areas of the organisation. We're not just based in one building, we're across many sites and we're a very diverse workforce with different communication needs. So we had a really good look at that and did some things very quickly to address those issues. At point 16, uh, 15 and 16, you can see that we also were committed to a, a much longer term vision for improving um, the way that we work together. Um, and we set out uh, the vision in our people strategy. The people strategy had a number of outcomes around having a high performing workforce, having committed and talented staff and staff that are engaged and knowledgeable. And we launched that programme in September with a really um, comprehensive programme of events. Um, I visited all the the, uh, the staff groups right across the organisation, as did my, my colleagues and our managers. We encouraged all staff to get involved. We gave them a pack of information and of different ways to um, have conversations around what they would like to see in work, where they felt they could improve their own well-being and the role that they could play within their teams. We gave everybody uh, a gingerbread man biscuit. Um, being a people strategy but obviously gingerbread people um, and we encourage them to have a gingerbread and a cup of tea and get together with your team and have a really good conversation with your manager about what you wanted to see for the future. So that was just some of the stuff that we did to try and bring people back together again. We then formally kind of launched a range of activity to address some of the challenges around longer term recruitment. We know that staff have said that they're very busy, that there's no time to kind of get the right skills in place and that we need to focus on growing our own. We now have four graduates in post who are being uh, very successful at the moment um, and they're now about to embark on a graduate development program that we've put together in-house so that they can be fully supported with mentoring, with additional training and through professional qualifications. 
We've also um, in included a new cohort of apprentices who are being supported through a range of mechanisms. We're working with staff on internal social activities. That's something that we really lost sight of through the pandemic when we were all at home. And I know it's something that everybody really enjoys taking part in. Um, so we've asked staff what they would like to see and we will be facilitating yoga classes, uh, a walking group and an all staff bake off. Um, it says which will be delivered in the new year, but it, it won't actually. It'll be delivered in about three weeks. Um, so we're making it a Christmas bake off. Um, and uh, all staff will be invited to submit an entry with their team or if they're not a baker they can come and buy cakes. So um, we are getting those social activities back up and up and running again and then we've also launched development days so a lot of our staff were telling us that they don't have time, they're very busy and that it doesn't always feel comfortable taking time out to do personal learning and development when they want to be part of helping their colleagues and delivering services. So we've created two development days that everybody can take to either work with their teams or individually to do team building or to explore other areas of the organisation or to attend personal development activities. Um, and we've had some really ex interesting examples of things and, and that teams have been doing to expand their thinking and to, to learn professionally. So some of those included at Appendix D, for, for examples. And then um, a, a few of the key themes that I don't think we can get away from, from in the, the survey were around the approach to organisational change and becoming better and, and more transparent around doing that. So we spent a lot of time briefing staff on our transformation programme to reassure them that it's not about um, kind of big changes within teams or people losing jobs. It's actually about improving the way that we do things and giving people access to new technology um, and making sure that we're able to consistently and continually deliver excellent services. As we've been doing that with the phase three of shared services, for example, we spent a lot of time and we've extended the engagement that we do with teams and services to really find out more about how they work together um, and to really get an understanding of what those individual roles are so that when we do look at making changes, everybody is engaged and is involved and has contributed and shaped what that change should look like. At point 20 there, we look at some of the inter improved internal communication, um, including um, a clear programme of IT improvement so that everybody knows what's happening and when. Uh, the uh, customer and digital director has been um, doing regular all council briefings to update everybody on the new technology that will be coming forward. And a communications plan has been developed that's quite visual and accessible um, for everybody right across the organisation that, so that they can see what's happening when and when they're likely to be involved. And we'll be using that on a much more regular basis. And then just finishing off there at point 21 with a point on the pulse survey. So the pulse survey was a more regular kind of temperature check of the organisation. We did the first one in June. Uh, it showed improvement in satisfaction in some areas, um, but it also showed that there were some things that we needed to, to focus on in terms of um, continuing to improve our efforts around staff engagement. That was further repeated with shared services in September 2022. And again, we saw much better improvement there, particularly in things like customer services, where there was a significant increase um, in satisfaction of about 39.4%, um, which shows that some of the actions that we've been undertaking to build capacity, to bring new staff into that area and to listen to those staff, uh, we're starting to uh, see better results. And then it's just a point at the end at point 25 and 26 around how we compare to some of our peers across the area, just highlighting turnover as a key metric of organisational health. Um, we see that South Ribble performs relatively well uh, in comparison to peers and we're projected to uh, be performing at an even lower turnover rate this year of around 12%. Um, so we have been through a period of change that's been consistent across local government. We've seen lots of churn um, at all levels of the organisation, um, right through to senior officer level. And that's been something that uh, many councils have seen. But we do expect that to return to a much lower level next year. Um, I think that concludes the key points. There are a number of appendices which provide some detail around the survey and the action plans, but I'm happy to take any questions or provide further information that you may wish for. Thank you. OK, thank you for that report, Vicky. We're now going to start off with the questions we've got, because we have, obviously have the pre-meeting. We review the uh, queries that the 
committee members have. So uh, I'll refer you to page 18, paragraph 9. References made to staff satisfaction being good. What is your definition of good within the context of the survey? And what is your view on some of the negative feedback? I think in terms of the, the survey and the findings report that's presented alongside it, I think it highlights that positive statements were made in response to around 75% of the questions. Um, so that could be um, seen to be good. But for me personally, it's not good enough until we've addressed those areas of dissatisfaction that are highlighted at, at point 10. Um, it, it's great if 80% of people are happy with their team and with their manager and the way that they can contribute to the council. Um, but we, we, we really want to see satisfaction in all those areas. So making sure that we are managing change well, that we are communicating and that there is a positive culture. Um, so I think that, yes, whilst it may be good and some of the statements could be classed as good for 75% of the, the questions, um, it's, it's not good enough until we've addressed those areas of dissatisfaction. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Sharple, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Um, same page, paragraph 10, it's looking at the difference between uh, satisfaction for those working in shared services as opposed to South Ribble. Uh, why do you think this is? Why, why is there such a big difference? Is there anything we can do to improve it for South Ribble employees? You've probably answered that partially already. But why, is there, why was there such a difference? So I think when we've asked the question of, of staff um, after the survey, we obviously followed this up with some focus groups to try and dig a bit deeper into what the reasons were for some of this. And, and I think, if I'm honest, I think it was at the time um, uh, a lack of... Uh, awareness and trust in what was what shared, shared services was. Uh, I think people who weren't part of shared services felt that it was something to perhaps be fearful of because it, it was an element of change. And in that respect, um, you know, perhaps it scored scored some of these um, areas scored lower. Um, and once staff have moved into shared services, they perhaps feel a bit more reassured. Um, and that there are um, kind of the mechanisms in place to be able to communicate well and that the culture is better. Um, so I think it perhaps is that um, sort of perception of what it might, of what shared services might mean for those who aren't within shared services. And we've worked really hard over the last 12 months to improve the integration between staff who were shared and staff who work for one council or the other. Um, and I think that that has been positive as we've started to increase the number of staff who have been in shared services. We've done more joint events and helped to build relationships across and between services. Um, so I think that may, may be part of the part of the reason. Um, but we'll continue to obviously to look at that in detail. You want to come back on that? Yeah, OK, right. Thank you. Can Councillor Unsworth, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's just on the numbers, really. Out of uh, 234, you got 131 back, which means over 100 people didn't respond. I know it's hard when they've not responded, but had you any ideas how we can engage people more to respond? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, Councillor Runsworth. I mean, when we commission surveys like this, they will tell us that that's a st statistically relevant level of response and that it's good good enough. But for us, we want to make sure that we're reaching all areas of the organisation. As I say, um, not everybody has access to, um, uh, you know, a, a PC to be able to complete a digital survey. So we do take paper copies out to all of the, the different venues, to the depot, to our ledger services, um, and we encourage staff to complete them. We have used incentives in the past, boxes of chocolates for those who complete more than 80% um, and other things like that. Um, but I think at this time in particular, when the survey was undertaken, um, there was a, people were working from home and adjusting to new ways of working. So that's something that we've we've learned a lot about now. And I think um, we would um, ensure a much broader coverage by using different ways of getting the survey out there, whether that be paper, whether it be incentives, whether it be posting things to people's homes, we'll, we'll have a much better idea of how to do that in future. Thank you. Was 234 the total number of employees? 
Uh, at that point, it may well have been. Now it's significantly more now. I think it's about 469 now, but I think at that point it was the total. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Unsworth. Councillor Walton. Thank you. Good evening, Vicky. Uh, my question is on page 21, um, and it concerns the Pulse survey uh, conducted in June 2022. Got a couple of questions. Um, what response rate was achieved from the Pulse survey comp compared with the employee survey results? And was it conducted in the same way to allow for a meaningful comp comparison. I've also looking at the figures, the pull survey for phase two was considerably lower than phase one. Did this include just the shared services or was that for all South Ribble employees? And the um, survey that we've got on this one, the survey questions, um, where that, that was just for shared services and not for the South Ribble staff? And what are you going to do? I know there's been things put in place for to increase staff satisfaction, but could you explain some of the things that have been put in place, especially for the employees who are working in phase two? Okay, thank you. I might need you to repeat some of those bits in a second. Sure. But <laughs> So in terms of the response rate for the Pulse survey, um, I, I'm, I have got the figures to hand somewhere, but I haven't, I can't just quite grab them in time to, to say now. But I think um, of the responses, it wasn't as high as the overall um, staff survey. Um, but I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, we didn't promote it as heavily. Um, we did encourage it, encourage staff to undertake the Pulse survey, but it was just that. It was really a, we want to ask you how you feel and if you want to respond, then we would encourage you to do that as it's something we'll be doing more regularly. Um, so it wasn't as high as the overall staff survey, um, but it did give us that kind of uh, view of the organisation. So um, I think... Um, we do have to be measured in how often we survey people. Um, people do get survey fatigue if we keep asking the same question over and over again. And we are asking people how they are in a range of different ways now because not everybody does respond that well to a survey. Some people prefer to speak in a focus group or um, to their manager or in a round table, whatever environment that might be. So we're trying to use a range of mechanisms. Um, the Pulse survey doesn't use the same methodology as the main staff survey. It's a much shorter survey. And whilst it goes to all staff and we do um, make paper copies available, we don't um, monitor it as much. It is a, if you would like to take it up, then there's the opportunity to comment. There may be ways that we can change that in future, but I personally think it's good to have a range of ways that staff can, um, can engage and tell us what they think all the time, not just necessarily waiting for a survey. We want to create a culture where staff can feed back to their managers or to um, colleagues, whatever it might be, to HR at any point without needing to be asked. And um, we want that open um, communication all the time. In terms of the phase two um surveys we did a pulse survey in june for all staff and then as part of monitoring the performance of shared services um, we do commit to doing just the shared services pulse survey and um, so that one was just for the shared service and that was mainly to look at how the new services that had been introduced so customer and ict um had been supported through that period and we did see an improvement um, but i think we also saw that as more staff have come into shared services, we need to be even more conscious of how we make sure we've got the right structures and ways to communicate in place um, because we did see a bit of variation compared to, to phase one. Um, so I think it just means that as shared services get bigger um, or if it does increase or the size that it is now, I think we need to continue to make sure that we're doing the best we can in terms of management and one-to-one -one meetings and team meetings and team briefings um, and maintain that consistent approach. So, yes, I hope that's answered most of the points. Thank you, Councillor Colton. Uh, on the same page, uh, item 23, it mentions that an additional survey, uh, pulse survey was carried out with shared services in September of this year. I think you partially mentioned, uh, answered this question. Uh, the, 
why wasn't that uh, continued with the rest of the employees? So this one, we'd just done the main staff survey in June um, and um, we were analysing the feedback from that and the results. Um, and I think we wanted to give a period of time to deliver some improvement and to put in place the things that staff had asked for. So we will repeat the all staff survey um, potentially after Christmas. We were going to do December, but I think um time is as it is now and so we're going to repeat the second repeat the all staff survey again but the shared services one is in line with the monitoring so we do tend to do that one at a slightly different point so that we can feed it in as part of the performance monitoring it's just a timing issue really and um, it's just how, how how the timings come about but the shared service issue does affect the rest of the uh, staff to quite an extent i would have thought yeah, yeah, it does. And um, because of the, uh, a big proportion of the overall workforce now, I think that's probably increased more over the last six months. So, um, yeah, they are more represented in the all staff survey because there are more staff in shared services. Um, but I think from a monitoring point of view, we do still monitor that group independently um, to understand the shared services environment as well, particularly given that they've gone through a period of, of change. So we want to really make sure that we're supporting that in that in that environment as well. Right, uh, I'd just like to come back with a question actually. So you said there's approximately 469 staff now in the organisation. Um, that would include leisure group and waste services. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, do you actually have a percentage split of how many of the employees of the total our shared services staff and how many of them have remained as South Ribble Borough Council staff? It's about 40%. Which way? 40% uh, shared services. Okay, all right, thank you. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Vicky. Um, my question is regarding the front cover of the um, staff survey on page 23. Um, the report is marked as a draft at 4th of January to 2022. Is this the final version of the report and results or will there be an updated uh, report with further um, survey results? This is the, fi this is the final version. Um, I, we, we approved this version. I'm not sure we didn't ask for another one with the draft taken off the front cover. Um, so this is the final version and then we repeat the full staff survey um, in two years' time. So that would be next year now yeah are you okay with that thank you councillor campbell councillor green good miss words um is there any trend information available on on the employee survey results when compared with previous staff surveys so that the journey over time can be monitored The survey prior to this um, was 2017, um, so that was the one um, undertaken, so this one was 2021, the one before that was 2017, and that was um, a, a, a different type of survey. We did continue some of the questions through to be able to see a trend, but I think it's fair to say that it was a significantly different context at that point in time. Um, so while some of the questions were similar, the trend I don't think was particularly reliable um, based on the information that was gathered in 2017. So hence starting with the 2021 survey as a bit of a baseline, which we will then continue for future years to use as a reference point um, and using the pull surveys in between that to monitor the, monitor the trend. Thank you. And the next question, please, Councillor Lomax. Yeah. Hi, Victoria. Uh, page 44 has some uh, very negative uh, material on it. Uh, what have you done about it and what improvements have there been? Thank you. So, yes, these questions refer to um, the senior leadership team um, and the confidence in the senior leadership team. I think at the, the point in time, the senior leadership team had been uh, 
become shared. This was very uh, new um, at that point in time. And I think it's fair to say that staff didn't particularly have the um, relationships or the awareness of the senior team. Um, that was due for that was a, a number of reasons, I suppose, because of the coming back to work from home, people weren't having the visibility and um, using different technology and communication. We perhaps hadn't figured out how to make sure that we were um, making sure that all senior members of the senior team were using that technology and using it for their briefings and their team meetings and their listening days and things like that. Um, so we've done a lot of work on that over the last 12 months. Um, we have put in place um, when we have our all staff listening days. So we had one in here not very long ago now um, where the chief executive will talk to all staff. Um, but then after that, the all of everybody attending will break out into round tables. And each of those tables is facilitated by a director or a member of the senior leadership team. Um, and staff can stay and have very honest conversations with those members of, members of the team and we will rotate around each table um, so that everybody gets to meet each other and put a face to a name. Um, so we do those on a much more regular basis now. We've now done two um, this year so far. We're also encouraging our senior team to be present and around and visible in the offices um, and to undertake their team briefings in quite a structured way um, on a regular basis. So we've put in place a framework so that all team members and all managers can expect to see their um, their SLT member um, on a regular basis and they will do something called um, Team Brief, which is an all organisation uh, newsletter, which they will then read out. Uh, and after that, um, staff can ask questions. So we've done a lot to try and make sure that the senior team are, are more visible um, and to build those relationships so that it's not just a, somebody who's a, a member of the management, but actually somebody who understands what the issues are and is available to talk to and to feedback to. And I think that hopefully should help to build the confidence. Um, and I think ultimately making sure that as a senior team, when decisions are made, they are communicated openly and transparently to staff. Um, so meetings and, and minutes and things like that are published um, so that all staff can understand the decisions that have been made. Um, so the, there's a range of things that are happening to hopefully improve that. And I, I would really hope that we see a huge improvement in that at the next staff survey. Councillor Lomax, I have a second question. Same question. OK, so the staff survey action plan, how confident are you that this action plan will deal with the quite stark feedback from the survey? Thank you. So, as I say, there was a short term plan, which was to do some of those things around visibility and to make sure that we had consistent processes in place and effective management controls. I don't think that on its own will achieve a lot. I think what we need to achieve is a, a more significant change in the culture of the organisation. And that's where the people strategy as a long term plan and vision really comes into its own to try to help to develop that positive culture of openness and transparency where anybody can provide feedback to any manager or senior leader or any member of the team at any point. And I think it's that that we really need to work towards. So whilst the action plan and some of those things will help to achieve improvement and to see things in the short term, what we really need to achieve is a much longer term improvement in the overall culture. And. And that's something that we particularly need to work on as an organisation. But I think all organisations, public and private sector, are trying to find ways to make sure that they reposition their culture in light of some of the major changes that we've all experienced um, in the way that we work. So that's something that we're learning about every day. And we're constantly looking for best practice from other organisations about how do you maintain a good culture? Um, hence why... We just want to try a range of different things and keep talking to staff about what works um, and, and continually improve. Councillor Great. Yeah. Yes. I know this isn't my item, and but I can't help myself sometimes. Um, I just want to support uh, what Vicky's just said, really, but in part around the, the action plan is um, it, the action plan itself isn't just a way of delivering the improvements. Um, it is the way that it's been de being delivered. So one of the things that was referenced was the um, lack of confidence in the senior leadership team. The senior leadership team now owns 
that action plan. Um, and they're expected, you know, or we're expected uh, to deliver these actions um, and, you know, uh, directly. Um, and that in itself will build up the trust because it will be seen with with staff who perhaps don't have those experiences in teams outside themselves. And again, one of the things I would just mention is that whilst we take the re the responses very seriously, you've got to see them all in context. You can't just look at one category of responses in isolation. If you actually run some alongside each other, um, the confidence of t uh, teams in their own leader uh, is actually quite high. Um, so it's a bit of an anomaly where they say actually confidence in the senior leadership team isn't high. But that's because the, the, the senior leadership team isn't necessarily working across the organisation. So that's by sharing responsibility for the, the action plan and its implementation rather than just being driven through the um, change and delivery directorate, which it isn't. Um, that's how we're addressing these issues as well. It's not just a plan. This is something we own and that's part of Vicky's team's drive to get it embedded. It's to get us... Uh, doing it as well, not just being imposed on people. Councillor Green. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, yeah, like um, Councillor Ormax, I was somewhat disturbed to read um, about some of these findings in here, and, and particularly the views that are attributed by members of staff towards the senior leadership team, which is damning. Um, but also taking you to page 39, is it just to pick another couple of points out so nearly two-thirds of members of staff believe that the council misleads employees a similar number that the council treats people unfairly um, and, and these again are damning comments but whilst we, we're putting procedures in place to address some of these issues and, and many more that there are amongst the staff how do we know that we're actually making an improvement so so we have the pulse survey for instance which was, was carried out six months after this staff survey and yet the Pulse survey only, carried, only asked four questions and none of those related to these significant concerns that had been raised. Did we not consider it having one or two extra questions to deal with some of these to measure whether there had been some change in, all, in that six month period? Thank you. Yes, we could have included any number of questions to test these things six months on. Um, but I think, as I said before, we want to um, embed a culture of good, open communication and transparency and, and trust. Um, and trust isn't always built overnight. Um, we would have hoped to see some improvement um, within six months. But I think it's much better to focus our efforts on building that trust, on working with staff and on using the opportunities that we have to engage with staff and to put action in you know put put principles into action rather than to continually repeat the same question and hope for an improvement um so i think staff through the surveys and through forums and feedback sessions and focus groups have had the opportunity to build relationships and to build trust through that process um, and to also give feedback. So we will repeat the question and we will ask, ask the same question again um, in the next staff survey. Um, but um, I think we need that time to build the relationships that will help people and to demonstrate the behaviours that will help people to have confidence in the senior leadership team. Would you like to come back? Okay. Councillor? Walton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have another question. I, again, on page 29, it, it is a, a, about staff morale is good at the council was a question and only 22.9% agreed. Now, to me, this is the basic thing. If your staff morale isn't good, you know, it, the whole um, organisation falls apart. So, I'd like to know what um, is put, being put in place. You have explained some. And then um, on page 67, the action plan. The actions appear to be quite generic and not very specific or measurable. So will there be any measurable targets uh, to um, monitor the progress and impact on progress? Thank you, Councillor Walton. So just on the first point in terms of morale, um, I think, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, this survey was done in a period of significant, not just local 
organisational but also national disruption um, and generally if you look at the statistics morale and happiness across the country mm. isn't particularly good at the moment and that's for a number of reasons you know don't need to mention the cost of living crisis um, and some of the uncertainty political uncertainty the position with regard to the pandemic at that point in time um, but there shouldn't be excuses that we use for not having good morale within our organisation um, that's something that we can take control of and can, can influence um, and that individuals can take personal responsibility for as well. Um, so we want to help our staff to have the best possible experience when they're in work. And there are a range of things that we've done to help with that. So around the cost of living crisis, we've been able to put in place support schemes, advice sessions, financial planning, um, basic reward schemes. So things like shopping discounts and things like that. So there are a number of things that can help with that aspect as well as the wider wellbeing framework that we have in place. Um, but then also it's just those things that I said before about um, being able to come back and take part in activities with colleagues. That's something that everybody really missed. And it's a huge part of having a good work working life is the social activity that goes with being part of an organisation. And I think it's fair to say that not just in work, but outside of work, we lost so many social networks and systems that we rely on to feel positive on a day to day basis. Um, so we're really kind of keen now that we put those mechanisms back in place we've put a few we've put a few suggestions forward with that we've asked staff what they wanted um, but ultimately a, a lot of the things that were running pre-pandemic were organized by staff um you know the football clubs the five-a-side leagues um the kind of nights out and things like that were staff organized and staff facilitated and that's what we want to encourage staff to do um we want them to get back to being social groups with their teams and that's not always easy when you see your colleagues on on teams um on digital channels or you only see them infrequently in the office but equally staff want the best of you know both worlds to be able to work in an agile way and to make the best use of technology so as i say it's something that we're grappling with every day in terms of the best solutions and um, we've put a few things in place that will happen here so that when staff know they're happening they're promoted right across the workforce and they can come and take part um, but I think it, it's just something that we'll need to continue working on. Um, so in terms of the actions, morale is, no, is very hard to measure. Um, morale is quite a subjective thing. Um, are you happy? Are you happy in your work? What makes you happy? Are you motivated? Do you want to come to work? It's all those things. And it can mean different things to different people, which is why it's important that we have a different range of ways of asking the question and monitoring the response and um, so I absolutely agree it's a it's a really good question and it's um, a really good point around the targets we will set some hard targets and um, but we will also continue to monitor satisfaction and morale through a range of different channels and um, some people view morale as positive opportunities for personal development some view morale as being able to go out with their friends after work on a Friday and um, so it will need to be a range of things to capture what morale means to somebody um, so we, I guess, my point is we shouldn't necessarily take this. Um, it, it is a difficult one to measure, but we will we will measure it again and put hard targets in place. Thank you, Councillor Colton. Yeah, uh, on page uh, again on sixty-seven on the action plan, uh, a number of items are marked as completed. Have there been any good outcomes from these actions? Uh, you have talked a little bit about uh, some things that the staff are arranging, uh, you know, social thing. Are there any more that you can take us through? Thank you. Um, so in, in terms of some of the actions, I think, yes, there's a social side of it, definitely, that we're starting to see come back again um, as people feel more confident to organise nights out and things like that. Um, there will inevitably be Christmas um, lunches and everything to come over the next few months, which I think will be a good opportunity for staff to get back together again with their teams and colleagues and enjoy festivities. Uh, just to some of the items on the list, for example, the passport to people management, um, um, a significant proportion of our, well, in fact, 100% of our managers completed that passport to people management program. And that was about reinforcing the fundamentals of being a good manager um, so that everybody had a common experience. Um, that wasn't the case beforehand. Not everybody would meet with their manager on a regular basis. 
not everybody will be able to have a one-to-one and that's really important so when you're talking about your well-being or your mental health or the things that you might be struggling with it's really important that you know that every month or every three weeks you'll meet with your manager and you can explain that to them and tell them how you're feeling and but equally so that the manager can say right these are your priorities for the next you know three weeks a month six months whatever that might be and so we've put in place those frameworks again and the passport to people management program was a way of reinforcing that making sure that everybody every manager knew that was the expectation We've also put in place a new performance review system and dynamic personal development plan. So every member of staff now has a role in personal development plan right across the organisation um, and they will complete that process and that conversation with that, their manager about, well, what do you want to achieve? What are your aspirations? How can I help you? What training do you need? And some staff will say the really basic things like, I just want to be able to have a, you know, a, a course on this or I'm pretty happy, thank you, um, but I'd like to have more opportunities to to attend meetings whatever that might be but then there are others who might have more significant development needs um, and it's an opportunity to have that conversation about the expectations around performance and improvement so we've put some of those things in place now and all staff now have them and um, have those regular development reviews um, we are looking at refreshing the intranets as a communication channel, but we've also looked at our wider internal communication. So as I said, we have a regular staff briefing that goes out to everybody. We use virtual channels like Yammer. We also have a staff newsletter that is posted at all the various venues. And we have an employee voice forum, which is a forum that comes together on a monthly basis with the chief executive and a member of the senior leadership team. I think you attended the last one, didn't you, Chris? Um, and it's an open forum where staff can bring any issues from uh, a broken door handle right through to what are we going to get paid next year and um, so we have those and they do don't they Chris and um, so they're very diverse uh, meetings and um, but they're great and um, because um, people come with a whole range of viewpoints and um, so we have we have those in place um, and we also have other things that aren't necessarily within our service but in other areas the workplace strategy that's looking at people's working environment and how we make sure that People have the right desks, the right equipment, um, the right lockers, the right when they come into work, they're not struggling to get logged in onto their PC or their their work, their laptop. And and as we know, that's something that we're we're on with, but we've made a lot of progress with over the last few months. And I think staff would say that they're starting to see some real improvement in that area. Um, and we will be doing even more to look at processes and systems and equipment over the next few months. Um, so I can hopefully report those to you next time when we see see some of that. Can I just come in? Uh, I don't, uh, just as a comment really, maybe going forward this can be included in the surveys, although I'm not really sure who puts the questions together. I don't see anywhere in here where you've asked the question about, we talk about being happy at work. Well, I mean, I don't think I was ever happy at work. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I'd be ha happy not to go to work and still get my salary. I mean, but the thing is, something more pertinent, I think, would be to ask, unless I've missed it, how much uh, how much job satisfaction do you get out of your job? I think is a more pertinent question than if you're happy. Now, I don't know if that, I mean, we don't have the breakdown of every single question, do we? But for me, job satisfaction is key. And if people aren't satisfied with the role they're doing, you know, what measures can you put in place to give them that job satisfaction? And, uh, and obviously, if people are more satisfied with what they're doing, you're going to get higher productivity, aren't you? Which I think was what Councillor Walton was alluding to before. So, yeah, is the is the question job satisfaction in any of the surveys? Do you know? So on uh, page 58, um, question, I think it's 6.32 of the analysis in the final report. Um, there is um, the question, what are your top three drivers for satisfaction? Um, and that is not not entirely the question that you mentioned but I think it is in that in that vein I think unless I've misinterpreted the question around um what are the things that make you keep turning up each day I suppose um and obviously the top one there is good pay um the second one is a positive upbeat working environment then flexible working good working relationships with my manager opportunities for personal development good IT, which is surprisingly lower down the list, I suppose, um, recognition from my manager, health and wellbeing support, understanding the vision and purpose of the council or other. Um, so that is something that helps to give an indication of why people turn up each day. Um, but I think it is something that we can look at testing in a range of different ways, because as I say, everybody's definition of what makes you want to come to work is probably slightly different. Right. 
thanks for that question. You're right to point me to this page. It, it sort of does sort of cover uh, the, the job satisfaction um, question. Okay, uh, Councillor Lou Jackson, please. Hi, Vicky. Going back to page 67 and the action plan, please. Um, it talks about the staff recognition programme. So please could you enlarge and talk us through what that includes and, and how we can, um, and how we are recognising our employees, please. Thank you, Councillor. That's a really timely question because that's something that we're working on, uh, working on at the moment. Um, we've, we haven't got we haven't got that in place at the moment. We're working with staff to understand what they would like to see in terms of reward and recognition. Um, so we've unfortunately not been able to do everything at once. Um, but this is something that we're, we're kind of having conversations about now. Um, what what do what do staff want to see? Do they want to see different uh, schemes? Do they want to see things within their teams? Um, we're looking at best practice from the private sector where they use various kinds of ways of um, kind of giving kudos to your colleagues and things like that, uh, whether it needs to come from the chief executive to make people feel more valued. It could be a range of those things. Um, so I don't have the answer to that one at the moment, but hopefully, um, well, I might not have the answer, but hopefully staff will give us the answer to what they want to, what they want to see in terms of reward and recognition. Thank you. Councillor Sharples. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, Page 78, measuring success. We've got a lovely, lovely thing there. It looks nice. Um, question was, where are we against the measures outlined and how is this being monitored? I don't think you need to go through where we are against the measures. We've sort of covered that. But in terms of how it's being monitored, will it be through our quarterly performance reports to members? Thank you. So um, the measures aren't reported in the quarterly performance reports um, to, to members as part of the, the corporate reporting. Um, they are included within our local indicators, so our uh, performance measures of how we're doing as an organisation more generally. Um, so we have a whole range of those um, right across the organisation that are used as management information for the senior leadership team and for managers. Um, and they will tend to use that information to look at how we can improve and where we might need to target activity. So they wouldn't typically be included in the quarterly report, but we could continue to bring them through for regular updates to, to yourselves. Right. Councillor Walton. Thank you. Please. Uh, my question, Vic, is on page 81, and it's about the People Strategy Action Plan update and to develop a programme of staff engagement. And you've talked through lots of staff engagement tonight, which is good, um, and we're very supportive of that. But are there any opportunities for staff to feedback on issues confidentially, as well as through the forums and other things that you've set up? Thank you, Councillor Walton. Um, so when we do um, any surveys, um, there are um, they are all anonymous, um, so staff can feel confident to provide their feedback without it being scrutinised or them being identified. Um, we don't have staff suggestion boxes as such, but that's something that we could look at introducing. We tend to just reassure staff that when we do the surveys, um, they are um, completely anonymous and they can say whatever they like in those. Um, we have had um, staff focus groups where staff can come together without anybody present from the senior management team or management and they can have a conversation between themselves about what they would like to see improve and then feedback separately. Um, so we've tried a range of different things um, and perhaps staff, um, staff suggestion, suggestion box is something that we, we could consider further. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Unsworth, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think you mentioned, did you, that you're going to redo the survey after Christmas. Is that what you said? Do you think that will be the right time to see some improvements in some of these things? Yes, I, I think... Um, We'll, we will. The pulse survey um, was to undertake a temperature check of the organisation on a regular basis. Um, so I would hope that after Christmas we will see um, some improvement. We've done a lot of work in that area. Um, shouldn't be, you know, um, kind of complacent about continually working with staff. Um, so I think hopefully, um, yeah, we will see we will see some further improvement come the pulse survey. Um, but we do we are talking to staff all the time, so we don't just rely on the pulse survey as a way to get that feedback. We've, we're having customer focus, group, focus groups every week with various staff groups, so we do get that live um, all the time rather than necessarily waiting for it to come in in a, a number format. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, when I was a teacher, one of my favourite sayings was, "You don't fatten the pig with weighing it." And I wondered what. And you, you've obviously done some qualitative stuff as well as through your focus groups. But I thought that maybe one of the interesting things would be the exit surveys that you do. I wondered what interviews. I wondered whether any interesting information had come through those. Yes, we do. We do um, interview exit interviews with with all staff. I do some of those um, myself. It's a whole range of things often why people are choosing to to leave or to move on. Um, I think, as I've said, right across local government and across private sector, we're seeing a huge amount of churn in terms of people moving between roles driven a lot by technology and the ability to work remotely um, and using kind of um, different ways of engaging with services or with work. Um, so I think there have been a range of, of reasons. Um, also because during the pandemic, people who might typically have looked for another job at that point because they were ready to progress in their career um, had chosen not to because it wasn't possible. Um, so I think um, for some people, it was the right point to then have a look at progressing and looking at a new opportunity. And as far as we want to retain people within our organisation, particularly those that we've invested in, um, we also want to, um, you know, in, in some cases, people do need to move on to find the next job. Um, but we do work hard to make sure that we create those opportunities internally. So, um, yes, we do, we do those exit interviews on a regular basis. OK. Any questions or comments from members not on the committee? No. Any questions of, or comments from members of the public? No. Could I please ask you, Darren, to formulate any recommendations? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just some of the themes from the discussion tonight the committee might like to consider as recommendations. Uh, the committee thanks the director for attending her detailed report and answering the committee's questions. Future pull surveys include a wider range of questions to gauge the views of employees. The committee looks forward to the setting of targets and measures of employee satisfaction to help ensure progress is made. Regular updates on the People's Strategy progress are to be presented to the Scrutiny Committee and the committee looks forward to receiving the results of the next survey in the new year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Darren. OK, we'll now move on to the next agenda item. Is the committee item, is the committee members happy with the items? I've got three, four, just one second. So can I start with the person I saw first, which was Councillor Jackson? Then I'll take a question from Councillor Walton. Just a good... Right. Councillor Green has a question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the draft recommendations. Can I just uh, query the last one, please? And that's in, in terms of getting the results of the next survey. We, we've waited 12 months virtually for the results of the last survey as a scrutiny committee. That needs to be much shorter so that we can analyse what will be time sensitive information. So is there a time scale that we can put on that, that we actually receive the full information as a scrutiny committee, please? Yeah, I think the results were provided some time ago, um, the full results. I think it's just taken this time to come through to the, the panel, unfortunately. Right. Does, that's, not does, my, that's not my understanding. It, it might have been some time ago, but, but we got a summary um, at an earlier stage and that wasn't acceptable. We needed a f the full detail. So if we're going, now going to get the full detail, we just need a time scale on that so that we can analyse it when it is timely. Okay. Uh, Vicky, could could you come back on that, please? That make a comment. So it's the pulse survey that we'd be undertaking, um, and then we undertake the analysis um, and we share it with staff. So it'd probably be within three months. Uh, Okay, and there's also the full staff survey. That one isn't due to be undertaken until, um, when is it now? So it was November 21, 22, so it'd be November next year when we undertake that one. So it would be the same sort of time. So this report was published and analysed and presented to staff probably by April time. Councillor Green, any further comments? Is there any way of speeding up that staff survey? Rather than, than it, I understand these things do take time, but but that five month period, it, almost the data is, is to an extent it's out of date. 
um, because further progress can be made. Uh, and it's important that we analyse that, that data to address any issues which are appearing. I can, I can certainly ask the question and when we kind of commission the survey, we can ask the, the research agency to see if they can do it more quickly. I would imagine by that point we have got um, a significant, significantly biggest workforce now than we had when we did the last one. Um, but yeah, I think we can we can ask, certainly ask the question and see if they can complete the analysis for us more quickly. Um, we don't do that work. They, they do it on our behalf so that it's all anonymous. Um, so yeah, I can certainly build it into the, the tender. Okay, so the recommendations have been read out and uh, I just want the committee to say oh, okay, they're okay with them, they're noted, yeah? Okay, thank you. Item seven. Thanks, Vicky, for your uh, support and input tonight. We appreciate it. Okay, um, item seven, South Rebel Leisure Company, and we have Mr. Chris Moister, our uh, company director here, to uh, give us uh, some introductory remarks over the report. Um, Chris, please, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, the, this report is before you tonight. I think it follows on from one of your recommendations, um, which uh, was a request to see the uh, South Rebel Leisure Company business plan. Um, it is appended to the report, but I, I thought I'd put it in a bit more context um, at this point in time. So the report covers a number of different headings. Firstly, um, at agenda page 84, um, I've, I've just addressed the, uh, I've headed it, governance and reporting arrangements and, and the roles of the different people involved in this uh, organisation. There is a slight amendment to that uh, now. So at... Um, uh, paragraph seven, uh, whilst uh, the director of commercial services has been appointed to the role of managing director uh, by the council, because that, that that was a decision made by council, um, the, the that director is no longer with the council, um, which is why uh, you have the misfortune of my presence tonight, because as one of the remaining two uh, directors, I, um, I volunteered or was pressed uh, to be the managing director of the company uh, in his absence. So the um, the remaining parties to it are there is a, a single shareholder for the company and that is the council uh, and that uh, function is discharged by the executive um, and I've appended to uh, the report the standing orders document um, which was part of the um, establishment documents for the company and this sets out the different delegations and functions of the different groups uh, within the company it's just to be clear as to who has uh, power to make which decision. Um, and then finally, the director of communities uh, fulfills the role uh, of client um, to the company. So that's the uh, council representative of the, um, the contract manager role on behalf of the council. And of course, they're supported by the uh, cabinet member uh, for health and well-being. Um, in the next section, I'll just quickly address um, the, uh, the structure around meetings. So uh, the day-to-day -day management uh, of the company is undertaken uh, by the managing director. Um, who has the uh, two um, senior uh, managers, uh, the company reporting directly into him or me now. Um, there are then board meetings every two months. Um, and, and at those board meetings, the managing director will bring to the board um, matters that sit outside uh, their delegation for decision uh, and produce update reports on progress of certain issues. Uh, and I've appended to uh, the reported appendix two just a template agenda to give members an idea uh, as to the reporting uh, that is undertaken at those meetings. Um, the accounts for the first trading year uh, are in the um, process of being produced and there is an update on that. They should be completed uh, mid-December with a view to being approved uh, to be audited. Uh, and form part of the council's group account uh, for the statement of accounts for next year. Um, sorry, for this year. Um, and that will be presented to uh, the shareholders um, after the board have approved them for recommendation to the shareholders. But that must take place before the end of December. Um, we also have client meetings, uh, which are organised by uh, the director of, uh, of communities. And as I say, these are effectively the client management uh, meet or contract management meetings uh, where the uh, client council uh, gets satisfaction as to the um, delivery being undertaken uh, by 
uh, by the company. Um, the contact, as I've mentioned in the report, is a two-way process. So not only are um, the company providing information as to what activities have been undertaken and performance, but it's also an opportunity for the company to raise issues um, or, or to seek clarification as to any changes in priorities of the council uh, that may have arisen uh, in the previous period, but also on the progress of certain um, project works, such as the decarbonisation works, which are within the preview of the council rather than the company. Um, so again, uh, I've appended uh, Appendix 3, uh, a copy of one of the client reports uh, that is submitted by the uh, company uh, to uh, the council. I then quickly touched on delivery of the council objectives, uh, and this is where we, we come into pr what you'd actually requested. So I get to your, your question eventually, uh, which is um, I've appended at Appendix 4 uh, the copy of the business plan. Now, I want to be perfectly honest with it. That is a first year business plan. Um, it is not in the form that we would like to see moving forward, uh, but it served a purpose uh, for, that for, that, for that initial period. Uh, and you'll see that there were um, two priorities really that the company set themselves. Um, one was uh, basically establishing the new staffing structure and moving on to the terms and conditions, which was a council decision uh, that we were to do that. Uh, and then the second was to um, support and try and move forward with the decarbonisation uh, and improvement works. Now, these are two key steps that the company need to take uh, in order to um, uh, progress with council priorities moving forward. Uh, the staffing structure obviously is, is, is key. Uh, if we don't get the right staff in the right place, then we won't be able to deliver the relevant services. Um, and the improvement works are necessary. Um, the Not only the decarbonisation works, but um, part of the aim is to make the leisure centres a more attractive proposition for users. Um, some of them, for want of a better phrase, are tired. Uh, and need some investment uh, and bring them up to the stand of some of the recent developments like the um, the pavilion and play pitches at provision that have just been completed uh, at Bamber Bridge. So those were the two priorities for this year. Um, but you will see that there is a list within the uh, business plan of other activities uh, that have been undertaken uh, by the council, uh, by the company to support council objectives, including things like the half uh, projects um, uh, this year. Um, performance within the um, contract documentation between the council and the company, um, there are a uh, series of uh, performance indicators, uh, and again, they're reported on within the uh, report, the, the client report uh, that's been provided. Um, but in addition, the, uh, there are management indicators uh, that have been prepared in relation to staff turn, uh, uh, staffing issues such as um, vacant uh, posts, uh, staff sickness. Uh, we also have some uh, attention given to um, health and safety performance. Uh, and I can tell you today as an update to this report, we've actually been audited uh, by an external health and safety consultant at the moment as to our health and safety provision. So we do try and take steps to get an external assurance as to how we're performing. Um, staffing. Um, the restructure has been one of the key pieces of work uh, for the company this year. Uh, we've been uh, very ably supported by the uh, Council's health uh, Health Human Resources uh, Service, um, and we're, the um, new structure has been adopted and is due for implementation from the 1st of December. Uh, many of the new posts um, have already been appointed to. I think there's just a two or three that requires uh, a level of recruitment, uh, but we're comfortable and satisfied that this will enable the, the company um, to deliver uh, the council priorities moving forward. It has been a challenging process. Um, the, the the previous um, uh, managers of the centre, uh, Serco, were a private entity. Um, they didn't have the same staffing structure, um, salary grade structure in place as local government do. Uh, so there was an element of um, uh, balancing. Uh, to make sure a job evaluation exercise effectively and we went through that pain in local government 10-15 years ago probably longer um, and uh, it, it's challenging for staff um, certainly that particularly as the commitment was that no one was going to really lose out as a result of it so in some instances we've had to manage certain roles upwards uh, in relation to salaries now that will be aligned 
uh, as matters progress and you get churned through an organisation. So uh, this is any salary protection is personal to that uh, employee rather than the post. Uh, the financial position, well, members will know, uh, having received the report last night uh, at full council, um, that actually the, the company has done um, as forecast uh, in relation to financial performance, both in terms of, um, uh, largely in terms of revenue uh, and expenditure, but there have been two uh, main issues uh, that have led to um, the, the company having to seek uh, additional revenue uh, from the council, uh, and that is the uh, utilities um, cost. Uh, which has absolutely skyrocketed for everybody um, and that has had a significant impact uh, on the leisure uh, sector in particular uh, but also uh, in relation to the pay award um, because that, that was higher than was expected uh, or higher than budgeted for anyway uh, and had a, a financial impact uh, for the company in that regard. Um, business planning, I mentioned before that the business plan, uh, it's a long document, um, I think it's yeah, that's part of 30 pages long. Um, it's not in the form that is familiar to the council. Um, it was a form that we, we adopted um, because that was the what was familiar to the managers at the time. And it was important that we got something in place that they could work to quite quickly. Um, but as, as I've outlined uh, in pay, uh, paragraph 27 onwards in the report, the approach we're looking to take moving forward with business planning. So, um, We've st already started uh, the process, but we are going to look to have um, a, a strategy document which, uh, which will cover a five year period. Uh, and this will uh, align with the um, council strategy uh, and will draw from it um, the, the priorities that the company are due to meet. Um, and it will also draw from the council's medium term financial strategy the uh, objective of making the company financially self-sustainable. Now, um, I know the council sought a commitment from the company to do that within three years. Realistically, that isn't going to happen, um, be, or at least as it currently stands, that isn't going to happen simply because of the um, utilities increases, if nothing else. Um, but there's still some uncertainty moving forward as to what the financial position will be in relation uh, to um, the uh, potential users as well with the cost of living crisis and what um, certainly around the country the leisure, the leisure industry have found is that this it's seen as a, um, a luxury item, uh, membership of gyms um, and some of the leisure activities that are supported by leisure centres uh, and use has dropped off and some authorities are having to close some of their leisure uh, service provisions, some of the private sector are having to close as well. So. Um, th the aim for the strategy will be to have um, a structured reduction uh, in the contribution uh, that we'll be seeking from the council uh, and that will be an evidenced structured um, reduction. So when uh, this is this is where I try and get my words out right because it starts getting quite complicated um, and I don't apologise for that um, because a lot of the, uh, the financial um, budgeting requirements are dependent on other factors, not least the delivery of the decarbonisation and improvement works. So it's very important that the council, the council and the company um, work together with the business planning uh, procedure, particularly services within the council, such as property services, so that we can make sure that when um, the, the, the improvements that we're seeking, that the, the company is seeking to make are aligned with the capacity and provision that can be provided by the property team within the council. Um, when we have the um, overall strategy and it looking to phase improvement schemes, promotions, we will then break that down and have an annual uh, service improvement plan effectively. It has a specific name in the contract documentation. I, I, forgive me, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but that will provide an annual uh, plan or uh, the company and that will be drawn from the strategy it will draw from the the phased proposed phase delivery within the strategy and it will have particular projects and uh, priorities uh, that the um, the company will look to meet um, and um, you will that will be delivered to the board um, and uh, it will be approved and then delivered to the um, the, the shareholders also for approval now it's important that we try and break some of these things down into uh, a shorter 
scope for delivery because it, then we can measure the impact of the changes we're looking to make. Uh, and that's one of the key things that the company are looking to deliver for the council. It's not just the health and wellbeing outfit uh, outputs, but it's making sure that the investment that um, that is necessary into the leisure centres actually delivers those outputs for the council. So we, we're looking to deliver in a way that it can be measured uh, and we can see um, that that will be through uh, additional usage of the leisure centres that will be hopefully through data obtained through uh, partners um, as to general health uh, outputs and uh, improvements. Um, what the uh, company will not be doing um, moving forward is engaging directly uh, with council partners unless the council directors to do so. Um, so it's very important that the council con uh, retain control over um, over the health and well-being outputs of the company um, and we don't go off and do our own bits and pieces uh, that are it will be complementary to council outputs but then are lost to the council to measure because it's very important that the council retain that kind of level of control um, so I've already met with the uh, council's policy and performance team which sits within uh, Vicky's team uh, within Vicky's directorate um, and uh, Jennifer Mullen, uh, the director of communities. So we've had confirmed now the priorities for the next five years. The next step for us will be to meet with um, the, the the policy and performance team and the managers uh, of the leisure centres um, so that we can start developing this five year plan. Uh, and uh, obviously finance will be involved in that but fortunately I've got the uh, director of finance also as a co-director uh, on the board so we get direct input in that regard um, and we will then start developing out the, the five-year strategy and the first one-year strategy uh, with a view to that being ready for approval uh, in early January. So um, I, I appreciate there's a lot of information there and I, and, I, and I know there will be questions but I would suggest um, that I come back again to see you um, in early in the new municipal year with the updated um, strategy and plan, because it, I think what you will see is there will be a, a difference um, in uh, certainly in presentation, but also in the structure um, of the content of the business plan. And I think you will be able to then see more clearly how it ties in uh, to delivery of council priorities. Um, as I say, we, we set certain priorities and um, performance information to try and gather a baseline this year. So it's not quite apparent uh, what purpose some of it serves. And I do understand that. So I'm happy to take a question. OK, I'd like to start by thanking you, Chris, for that um, exhaustive report uh, made very simple as well for us to understand. Um, uh, I mean, the contracting side of it. Um, please, could you remind us? You might have answered this partly anyway. Please could you remind us about the reasoning, rationale and benefits of the council setting up the leisure company? Uh, yeah, yeah it, it was twofold, really. Um, I, I think, firstly, um, there are certain tax advantages uh, for the council being set up, uh, setting the company up. It's set up as um, a charitable company. It's not for profit. Um, so it has certain uh, advantages in relation to um, the, uh, the the tax payable um, business rates. Thank you. Uh, um, that would be payable. Um, and also as a, a charitable organisation, even wholly owned by the council, it's eligible to apply for certain grants. Um, uh, and funding from external sources that wouldn't be available to the council. So whilst it, it is effectively a service of the council in the way that the, the company has been structured uh, and held, um, it does have advantages uh, to us financially. OK, right. Uh, Councillor Colton, question two, page 84. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, Chris. Uh, I'm looking at page 84. The top paragraph uh, discusses the structure, the management structure of the uh, the company. Um, the directors of the company are also directors of the council. So what's concerning me, how is it possible to be a director of the company but also director of the uh, council you know you know where do these people's 
loud as Larry, you know, and is there going to be a conflict of interest? It, it, yeah, um, it's a perfectly fair question. Um, there is a potential for a conflict of interest to arise, and I, can't, I don't think we can pretend otherwise. Um, but what I would stress is that the, the company business is discharged at the direction of the council. Um, so the, the, um, the association, memorandum of association of the council basically says you are to work to the direction of the shareholders and the shareholders are the council. So it's very clear um, that the, the, the objectives of the company mirror the objectives of the council. Now, um, where there could, a conflict could arise is more uh, in relation probably to the director of finance than it is um, for anybody else um, because of the... <laughs> There was a recent. There was a request yesterday uh, for additional funding um, for the um, for the company. Um, the reasons were perfectly legitimate. Now, had they not been, um, but le legitimate for the company, but not for the council, then it would have been a request from the director from the company. Um, also, then having to advise the council as the that it's not legitimate council purpose. So there is a potential conflict of interest, but only. Um, in very narrow circumstances. It is something we're aware of um, and we deliberately um, chose these directors to do, to um, take on the roles initially because of the need to get the governance right, the finances right um, and there was this necessary investment in the properties which was why the um, commercial services director uh, was picked up as a managing director. Um, but there is an opportunity when things are up and running correctly to change who sits on that board. At the moment, I think it, the way that the um, the structure is set up, that is not necessary. I, I can't see a conflict arising. There is a risk, but I don't think in practice it will arise. OK, thank you. Just one other point. As a matter of capacity, you know, if you, we've got a director of the council, which I presume is like a full-time job. Well, hopefully it's a full-time job. <laughs> so how, you know, is it physical, uh, possible to be also director of this company, which you know, could be quite a, an onerous task? Um, again, um, it's a very fair question. The, the role of the director of commercial services um, was respect to specifically give it capacity to take on the operational management. The call on the time of myself, uh, sorry, the director of finance and myself when we were just directors, and I say just directors rather than managing director, was relatively limited. As I say, it was maybe an hour every couple of months because we were just to attend board meetings. Um, I won't pretend uh, that currently, because I've taken on the operational management, it isn't challenging. Um, my daughter's forgotten what I look like um although that's not necessarily a bad thing for her um but yeah it, it is difficult um and i'm placing reliance on my service leads um to to shoulder additional responsibilities but at the moment it is only supposed to be um, this is a short-term solution because there's a vacancy that needs to be filled um you know if that when that uh, post is filled and that is addressed then i, I suspect there'll be kind of a reallocation of work again you do, uh, you do have su support staff to shoulder some of the burden, I presume. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, I'm blessed with having Darren um, as one of my service leads. I've also got Dawn Height and, uh, and Dave Whelan, um, you know, who, and, and I've got very experienced team leaders and managers below that as well who, you know, are all, I mean, just going back to the staff survey results, are all really proud to work for the organisation uh, and are prepared to step up and take on additional responsibilities. Not forever but you know in order to meet a need thank you uh, still on page 84 councillor walton please good evening chris uh, my question follows on from councillor Coulton's is that are there any arrangements in place for the director of commercial and co um to be filled in the near future 
I'm possibly not the right one to ask that question because I think that's more a matter for the council rather than uh, for the company. Um, I, I understand, yes, um, that there is a, a temporary appointment looking to be made. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I, I, I've not, I can't say for certain. I've got another question, um, Chair. Um, talking about the finance, the financial position, and it says on page 85 that the council, uh, the the um, there wouldn't be any need for any financial support from the council till the financial year 2024-25. And we understand, as we discussed last night, what the reasoning why we, we have to um, provide more funding. But uh, And we welcome the grants for decarbonisation, but um, there's going to be an impact on the revenue due to closures because of decarbonisation and refurbishment. Has there any contingencies been put in place to offset that? Um, there haven't been financial contingencies put in place, but um, what the uh, company are looking to do is to protect service provision. So by working closely with the, the, the project team in property services, what we're actually doing is moving around um, some of the contracted uh, users, schools, swimming lessons. Um, I mean, we're very fortunate to have three uh, swimming pools uh, within the company, within the borough. Um, so it gives us a, an opportunity to, you know, and um, sweat the assets. That sounds awful in a, a leisure centre. Um, but it, but to enable us to offer the, the, the same service, but in a different location, um, there is a small cost to that as well, because obviously we provide for uh, the transportation for the schools. So you've got schools who use the Bamber Bridge Leisure Centre, for example, who are suddenly going to have to go to Leyland. So there, there is an additional cost um, to the company in doing that, but we will retain their use and we will retain their goodwill. Um, so it, it's seen as a, we're, we're doing our best to protect the income, I suppose is the best way to put it. Um, now, we kind of have to take that hit um, because it, when we get the, and, it, and I will say when we get the provision right um, after the refurb works, um, we will then be really looking to drive new memberships greater use and work with the council not only in just the um you know the, the core uh, health uh, sorry ac sports activities but looking you know, there was um the social prescribing report last night um and again i think councillor smith mentioned you know we've been running social prescribing from the leisure centers for a while which we have but there's a greater scope to use uh, those those resources to support that so again it's we want to get to cost neutral. I, I, I had an interesting conversation this afternoon at the management meeting with the team, and they 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 were saying, look, previously with Serco, we kind of had this dial, and we had to dial it up to bring in the income. I said, well, you've got the same dial, but what you're dialing it up to is to get the health outcomes that we want. You know, it, it's reaching the people that we want, and and they were kind of so it kind of light switched on. You know, it's moving from the private sector into the public sector. Yeah, don't get me wrong. If we can get an income um, to support the activities, great. But the, the priority is getting those health outcomes at a cost neutral basis. Bill, going back to page 34, Councillor Lomax, please. Question four. So, the Cabinet Act as shareholder and the accounts are provided to the shareholders or shareholder at the AGM. What role do the other members of the council have? And will the AGM be open to the other members and indeed the public? Um, it will certainly be open uh, to all members because the council are their shareholders. It is just that, uh, well, the, the executive are there to, to fulfil that function. Uh, and it... If you look at the split, um, what will actually happen in practice, uh, sorry, scheme of delegation and responsibility split, what will actually happen in practice is that the executive will have to present certain reports to full council in any event. So all councillors will get a say uh, when there's a, a change in, for example, budget provision requirements and so on. Um, as to whether the public um, can attend, I would say that is a matter for members. Um, I'm pretty open and transparent about these things. Um, I, I don't really have any concerns about 
you know, the, the budgetary information being provided because it's going to be reported. It's going to go in the uh, statement of accounts as as part of the group accounts. So it's it's in the public domain anyway. So if the public wanted to attend, fine. Um, but I think what I would say is that the under a separate head, the work of the company will be reported to all members anyway. Um, so the, the you will still be scrutinising over my shoulder um, the executive member. For health and well-being in due course and the performance of the company will be part of that scrutiny be so members do have a role it might not be directly in relation to the company but it will certainly be in relation to the the company outputs okay next question is myself page 99 so the example leisure company board agenda the agenda includes key items with some of the most important ones around performance staffing business planning and health and safety being verbal reports. Is this typical? Why weren't written reports provided to the board? Sorry, no, um, the, the, it does say it's the uh, meeting of the 17th of March. Um, that was just the, the date the template was set up. So it's not actually um, an agenda that was used, but it is the template agenda. We do look to get written reports. But sometimes it will be a verbal update because, for example, the health and safety uh, update might simply be there is no uh, there is no update. Um, so, yeah, it, it, we do look to have reports drafted and prepared and that we ask that they follow a similar form to the templates that are used for council reports. Again, that's to assist the directors with familiarity, but it's also to uh, make sure that um, the officers are familiar with the process as well, so we're not giving them something else to learn. Thanks for that response. Councillor Walton. Thank you. Me again. Um, from page 109 to the Leisure Company Business Plan, are there the key performance indicators? Are there some key performance indicators for the company? And the business plan includes some very generic priorities which aren't very specific or measurable. Could you say why this is? And is it something that the company could review so that we can be provided with measurable impact and targets? <clears throat> yes, uh, there are key performance indicators and they're the ones that were set uh, within the, the contract between the council uh, and the company and they are reported against. Um, we are looking to develop some more detailed ones as part of the business planning uh, process on this occasion, but and they're both in terms of management information, but also on performance information for um, for reporting back to the executive. Um, and yes, the, the, the business planning process. Yeah, you're right. The, the business plan isn't great. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the introduction, we are looking to revise that yeah. process and bring it more in line uh, with the council process. Um, so we'll, we're actually working with a council team to um, to develop it is something that's not familiar um to to the staff at the the leisure centers with not having worked in the environment before um they're, they're up for it they're willing they see the benefits of it so i'm optimistic that the next time i'm presenting something to you like this yeah. you'll be there going yeah i'm happy with well happier with that anyway okay. councillor jackson please hi chris um just want to ask what happens if there's a dispute um, between the needs of the council and our corporate priorities and if the leisure company wants to do something differently? Um, the, the way that the, the company um, structure documents are set out kind of prevents us doing that. Um, the company uh, is, is really under the thumb of the council, for want of a better phrase. Um, you are the shareholder. Uh, and the shareholder ultimately controls the board. Um, now, I think the other benefit, and I think Councillor Colton's question about the the directors and who they are, the other benefit to that is we are also council directors. We are not going to be inclined to move away from council priorities. Um, this is not a private entity. It, it's it is a separate legal entity, but we're not. We're not there to do anything other than the council directs, and that's how the company has been established. So that's the answer, really. We can't. OK. Hey, Councillor Green. Um, can I 
Thank you, Mr. Mostafi. Very full and, and frank responses this evening. But just a couple of questions from me, if I may, please. So, how, how does the company's performance management arrangements fit into the council's arrangements? And will we see some of the key performance indicators for the company included in the quarterly performance reports, which are considered by the scrutiny panel and cabinet? Um, first part first, um, the, the reporting of the key performance indicators is done through the client meetings. So that's done uh, to um, direct for communities and that's then shared with the exec member if in fact the exec member doesn't attend those meetings, which I think he does. Um, if you want them included in the um, monitoring reports, I think that, to be honest, is probably a question you needed to direct to the council. I, I'm not trying to be evasive here, but I'm trying to, one of the challenges there is, is being wearing two director hats, is trying to make sure you only wear one at once. Um, so I'm, I'm really not trying to be awkward, but I'm trying to confine myself to being a company director today. And I don't really have any influence over what goes in those monitoring reports. Um, I would imagine um, that you can trace into the, company performance through the monitoring you get in relation to the performance of the council outputs anyway, because, you know, they're, they're so intertwined. Thank you. OK, OK. Councillor Unsworth, please. Thank you. Um, mine's a really simple question <laughs> compared to all these complicated ones. Um, when I was recently at Le uh, Leyland Leisure Centre, uh, there were some complaints about the Wi-Fi system not uh, stopping them answering the phone and when people were getting through they were really fed up and they were getting lots of hassle. I just wondered whether that had been resolved. Simple answer, yes. Um, I, again, um, yeah, there were IT challenges. Um, the, the syst we weren't helped. I think that the, um, the outgoing user took much of their kit with them uh, and left the, the centres a bit short. Um, so we had to make some um, short term implementation and then IT have come in and actually delivered what is needed now. Um, there's still some work to be done. Uh, and part of that is because we didn't want to do the full IT refurb before we did the, ref the um, structural refurb works because you start doing things and then having to undo them and redo them. So there were cost implications on that. So we've got something that works uh, that I think staff are now happy with, touch wood. Um, but yeah, yeah, it wasn't acceptable, um, and we we ac we acknowledge that. But we did work quite hard and quickly to resolve it. I think this is. I don't know if my issue is a little bit more recent than that one. That one was people having difficulty booking, wasn't it? This was where, when people were ringing, they were just getting the the circle going round and round and round because they said the Wi-Fi signal wasn't good enough for them to answer. Um, is that? I'm not aware that that's still ongoing, but I will make some inquiries and I'm quite happy to uh, come back and um, put some information through Darren for the committee's uh, response. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Kath. Councillor Sharples. And finally, moving forward, will the leisure company attend scrutiny on an annual basis, as it used to with the Leisure Trust, alongside the Cabinet Member for Health and Wellbeing? Sorry, Kath. Probably end up with pictures of me when Colin was speaking. Then I apologise for that. Um, our, the the company will do um, what scrutiny want you to. Um, we are in a, a funny position uh, in that I think that the company it should be treated as a key partner uh, and therefore stand alone in some respects, which is why I'm here on my own. I, I did discuss with you whether it was appropriate for um, the director of communities and and Mick to attend on the table with me, but I don't think it really was because. The, the scrutiny was of the company uh, and we are separate. But in in, oper in operational, in a practical sense, what the company are doing is delivering directly for the council, practically as part of the council. So if it would assist uh, the, the scrutiny of um, that portfolio, yeah, quite happy to attend. Um, or if, if you want me to attend separately or the company to attend separately just to specifically address company issues, quite happy to do that as well. That's the other benefit of, uh, you know, the directors being a director of the uh, of the council as well. We're quite happy to oblige. OK, any further questions? No. OK, any questions or comments from members not on the committee? Yes. Councillor Titherington, please. 
uh, just uh, comments on the, uh, the the final question. I think uh, obviously it's up to scrutiny who they invite, uh, and they can invite who they like and scrutinise what they like, and that's uh, that's your prerogative, uh, Chair. Um, I think from my point of view is that from the company, what we want from the company is for them to deliver on our on the portfolio, on my portfolio's um, purpose and, and vision. And that is, I mean, and I think Chris did uh, allude to it, is that in the end, it's all about the key outcomes in terms of health and well-being for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for, for, our, for our residents. So whilst we're the, we're the main shareholder, and, you know, just to confirm when I say we, I mean the council, <coughs> and uh, so the performance will be measured on the outcomes that we get in improving the health and well-being of our of our, <coughs> of our residents. So I mean, <coughs> and when I come before uh, scrutiny, um, that's I suppose is what you will be asking me about. I mean, and if you require <coughs> representatives from the company to uh, to attend as well. Uh, well, you can you can certainly do that, but I <coughs> excuse sorry about this, <coughs> but um, I think they, they I think they are uh, separate pieces of scrutiny to be fair, to be perfectly frank. I mean, it's about the operation, of the company, and all that. But as far as we're concerned, as the shareholders, it's about delivery and those key performance indicators that you uh, you spoke about. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Any questions from or comments from members of the public? No. Can I please ask you to formulate the recommendations, Darren? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Some of the themes from the discussion tonight um, that you may wish to recommend. Uh, the committee thanks the director for attending and his detailed report and presentation, including answering the committee's questions. Um, the committee welcomes the offer of the committee um, receiving the next leisure company business plan. Consideration be given to the Council's quarterly performance report, including key leisure company indicators, and that the leisure company be invited to attend scrutiny on an annual basis. Thank you, Chair. Okay, is that all right with the committee members? Right, I'd like to thank you, Chris, for coming along tonight. Uh, it's been very interesting. Thank you. Turning to item eight. Oh, yeah, you've got to. Yeah, it's okay. It's Chris, yeah, and I know Councillor Lomax, you've got to go at eight. Uh, okay, now turning to item eight, scrutiny matters. I'd like to uh, welcome Councillor Jackson uh, to give us uh, an update on the Lancashire County Council Health Scrutiny Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've attended um, two, two committee meetings and um, this, this, the meeting that was postponed, uh, well, before before my item. So uh, there's lots of information to give. I've given you some information over the internet. I've given you paper copies so you can look back and refer to the information uh, that was given to me. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start with the NHS Lancashire and South Cumbria integrated care board presentation that was given by uh, Kevin Lavery, who's the chief executive. He was explaining and defining um, what Lancashire and South Cumbria integration boards were. He said the integration care board is a statutory NHS organisation responsible for developing a plan to meet the healthcare needs of the population and to manage the NHS budget and arranging health services in the geographic area. The Integrated Care Boards were legally established on the 1st of July 2022, replacing the clinical commissioning groups. The core purpose of the Integrated Care Board, he said, was to improve outcomes in population health and healthcare, to tackle inequalities in outcomes, experience and access to services, and to help NHS to support broader social and economic development. An Integrated Care Board is a partnership of organisations that come together 
to plan and deliver joined up health and care services. The 42 integrated care boards were established across England on a statutory basis consisting of healthcare partners including local authorities, the NHS, the voluntary community and faith groups and social enterprise with independent healthcare providers. Kevin Lavery talked of provider collaboratives as part of the new legislation the provider collaboratives work at different levels of the system according to need. By working collectively, the providers will be more successfully said as individual organisations than individual organisations to make a more successful system. A provider collaborative board, a PCB, has been established to enable partnership working of acute mental health and community providers across Lancashire and South Cumbria. He said the benefits of provider collaboration were one, to Im improve safety, capacity with access to quality care, two, better workforce planning and skill sharing, three, reduce healthcare inequalities, and four, better use of clinical and corporate resources. The key challenges he saw was uh, the need to strengthen our community health services, the importance of relieving financial pressures on hospitals and putting stronger fo focus on delivery. He, he'd like to ask NHS centrally for some freedoms and flexibility to move better, faster and smarter. Key areas, areas for scrutiny committee considerations uh, to expand virtual wards to support the clinically vulnerable to stay in their own homes, to strengthen community services to improve hospital flow, continuing healthcare to consider new models of delivery in Lancashire and South Cumbria. For more details of any of the above points, please refer to the previously sent presentations. This summary was provided by me. On a personal level, I thought uh, long and hard about the role, my role in scrutiny and how I can be more effective in this appointment. Firstly, I should liaise with community and residents, which I have done and continue to do so, to be a voice for them and to bring their valid concerns to this table. At the last health scrutiny and adult service meeting, I met with members of Protect Chorley and South Ribble from Cuts and Privatisation campaign. I asked them to provide a list of points of concern to the establishment of the new integrated care boards. This action would enable a resident's view of the changes. And this is what they provided from their experiences of current services in the NHS and their fears regarding privatisation of NHS services in the future. One, they fear private companies prioritising shareholders over patient care. Two, many procedures are no longer, longer available on the NHS. Dozens of items of medication are no longer available on prescription. They say 60 NE departments across England have been closed. Ambulances queue for hours outside of the ones remaining, unable to respond to other emergencies. There are above 110,000 staff vacancies in the NHS, 50,000 of them medical posts. NH NHS England is now divided into 42 footprints, each with its own budget not to be exceeded. They said this will result in even longer waiting lists when the money runs out and those who can afford will pay privately, expanding that sector and those who can't pay will suffer with their condition worsening. Uh, the residents fear more doctors and nurses will be drawn out of the NHS to the private sector as it becomes more lucrative and the environment less stressful. They ended by saying, we must preserve our NHS. Next, I would like to um, 
just touch on the three complete presentations that were delivered on the 13th of July. And just to refresh, you have got this information. It's been sent very kindly by Darren over the internet, my request. Um, the first presentation um, we received at that meeting was the portfolio and update as provided by Lancashire County Councillor Graham Gooch and Mr Ian Crabtree, Director of Adult and Community Care. The press presentation set out their vision to support people to live independently, healthily and with the right level of care. To work with partners to share ideas and knowledge creating adult services that, are, that better meet needs. To value communities and provide support to family, friends, neighbours and colleagues with accountability. The second presentation was presented by the Dire Director of Public Health Lancashire, um, also assisted by Councillor Green. Health is everyone's business referring to the Healthcare Act of 2022, whose statutory responsibilities is to address health inequalities. Most factors that determine health sit outside the NHS and within the influence of local government. The third presentation was uh, the Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care Board update by Kevin Lavery. Um, so I would now like to provide my summary of the Lancashire and South Cumbria New Hospitals Programme, as given by Jerry Hawker, who is the senior responsible officer of the above. He wanted to give an update. Um, he said the Lancashire and South Cumbria has stated its preference for new hospitals on new sites for both Royal Preston Hospital and Royal Lancaster Hospital. I think it's infirmary, as part of the new hospitals programme, which plans to offer the best in modern healthcare and address significant problems in the current ageing hospital buildings. A reminder was then given of the published shortlist. And they are a new Royal Lancaster infirmary on a new site with partial rebuild and refurbishment of Royal Preston Hospital. Next, a new Royal Hospital, Royal Preston Hospital on a new site with partial rebuild, refurbishment of the Royal Lancaster Infirmary. Third option, investment at both the Royal Lancaster Infirmary and Royal Preston Hospitals on new sites. To evaluate each of the shortlisted options, the following key elements have been used. Service configuration, what would be required in terms of rooms and beds and other provision to be able to meet occupational, operational space and location requirements. The resultant recommendations and preferred options for both hospitals are subject to the endorsement of Lancashire Teaching Hospitals, the NHS Foundation Trust, University Hospitals of Morecambe Bay, NHS Trust Boards and NHS Lancashire and South Cumbria Integrated Care Board. The NHS in Lancashire and South Cumbria has stated its preference for new hospitals on new sites for both hospitals as part of the new hospitals programme. Lancashire and South Cumbria new hospitals programme's preference for Royal Preston Hospital is a state-of-the-art hospital on a new site with enhanced urgent and emergency service with increased capacity for specialised services. The programme's alternative for RPH is an improved hospital on its current site to include a new emergency care village together with replacement of some inpatient facilities for non-elective medical and surgical patients and the replacement of nine theatres and diagnostic facilities. Lancashire and South Cumbria's new hospital programme's preferred option for Royal Lancaster University Hospitals for Morecambe Bay Trust is a new hospital on a new site to improve patient experience, the quality services provided for patients, visitors with quality services provided for patients, visitors and staff. The programme's alternative option for RLI is an improved 
RLI in its current location to include a new urgent and emergency care village with provision of critical care maternity and neonatal services with some inpatient accommodation and diagnostics. Work is underway to assess viability of potential sites for both hospitals. No final decisions have been made. The new hospitals programme will continue to involve patients, local people, staff and wider stakeholders in the proposals. There is a published Your Hospitals, Your Say report which is available on the new hospitals website and if you just see by the side of you I've, I've placed this little piece of paper so you can access the site to give your views. Uh, to date, and that was at the time of me writing this report, um, 15,579 people, including patients, NHS staff and the public, have shared their views. The report outlines their views so far and the informed decisions to date. Now, we've got to also bear in mind there that there's actually uh, 1.8 million people in the Lancashire and South Ripple area, South Cumbria area. Um, your views and feedback can be given at this, this address. Um, so the summary has been provided by me. I, there's been lots of information there and that's why um, I've written the information and sent it over the internet. So if you've any queries, you can look back. I know it's a lot of information for you to take in uh, at this one time, but that's for your um, ease. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the committee members on that report? No. Okay. We'll move on to some 8B, please. Meeting and trainings attended by scrutiny committee members. Members might like to reflect on the questioning techniques training undertaken by the committee last month. Any comments? Yeah, it was. It was very good. Yeah. OK, well done, Darren. Thank you. Um, item 8C, Cabinet Forward Plan. Members are asked to flag up any Cabinet items that might be of interest to the committee. No, there doesn't appear to be any. OK. Next and finally, item 8D, Scrutiny Committee. Oh, I've just done that, haven't I? Oh, sorry. 8D Scrutiny Committee Forward Plan. Members are asked to review the forward plan. Councillor Green, you may wish to update the scrutiny review of the impact of the Housing Development Task Group, please. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Lomax. Yep. Thanks, Chairman. But before I do that, there's just one item on the Scrutiny Committee Forward Plan. Yep. Um, so, so there's an update um, listed for March from Councillor Wojnski Gelder as to the refugee resettlement progress update, uh, which is obviously an important item that members will, will wish to consider. But we've not actually um, seen Councillor Wojnski Gelder to give us a full portfolio update, and I'm just wondering sure. whether that could be incorporated as part of a full portfolio update at that meeting. Because um, obviously she has, she has an important portfolio, so, so we'd probably like to review that. But included in that, obviously, the resettlement programme yeah. for refugees. I think that's very useful. And uh, can we do that, please, Darren? And then, and then I'll take questions from Councillor Coulton and Councillor Walton, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there seems to be a, a dire shortage of <coughs> dentists and also, so to an extent, uh, doctor appointments. Should we not be looking at this. In the past, I don't know how many years ago it was, we had a, a scrutiny committee which was open to the public, which I know this is open to the public, but it was advertised a lot. And we had quite a number of the public attending where we had uh, representatives of the NHS in front of, I think it was at Chorley, was it? Was it? I forget where it was anyway, but it was very, very well attended. And I was wondering whether we should do a similar exercise. So, yeah, Darren will sort something out for us on that. Uh, right. Councillor Coulton. Uh, Councillor Walton, did you want to speak? Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, the schedule for the new municipal year, the evaluation of community hubs. I would like that brought forward to this uh, municipal year, if we could. Because that, uh, that's something that I think we all need to be uh, aware of because uh, there'll be elections coming up and uh, yeah. it, it's something that I think we, we really need to find some information about um, budgets and and projects. Darren, can we put that on the agenda? We'll, we'll schedule that in. We'll schedule that in. Schedule that in. Councillor Jackson, did you want to talk? Only to say I think that's a really good idea, uh, and especially uh, referencing the integrating care boards, we, we need to see now the effects on our community. And, uh, you know, you're talking about dentist appointments, doctor's appointments, all kinds of things within the health range, you know, and if we could have these people just to, to talk to and, and, and answer our questions, that would be really helpful. Uh, Councillor Unsworth. Yeah, I, I don't know whether um, where this fits in, but there's been in the news about damp and mould. I just wondered whether there was any role for scrutiny to find out what ways a councillor are responsible for. Um, we actually discussed this so when we had our pre-meeting, you're right, and we do have within the council housing stock, don't we, which... Um, is links with housing associations. It's links with housing, housing, sorry, of course, links with housing associations. And maybe we can just have discuss having some kind of a quality audit from the providers. So we'll look into that. Yeah, we can look into that. Okay. Councillor Coulton? That problem, I think a lot of it uh, was down to design, it? With, with, you know, rooms with no ventilation at all, which was creating the so. Yeah, we'll look That's into it as part of it. Planning. Yeah, there's no no reason for it not to uh, look at uh, improving existing buildings, regardless of when they were built. Right, uh, Councillor Green, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. You, you you did ask me to update on the um yeah. the task group of sorry. the impact of housing development, and and we got way away with other issues. So not 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 your fault at all. Uh, just to say that that task group has been established. Um, I'd like to uh, thank our officers um, for, for their support in that and to thank the members that are on this. That's Councillor Unsworth, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Walton and Councillor Thelborn. We've got a, a number of meetings scheduled moving forwards uh, to interview lots of individuals. So I'm, I'm looking forward to those and, and getting our teeth into what is an important issue for members. And it's something that members often bring up. I'd also like to thank those members who, who've had the opportunity to complete the questionnaire today. If you haven't done so, please do so. And if you can remind your respective group members as well of the need to do that, because we, we'd like to get as much information as we possibly can, which will allow us to focus our questions uh, and ultimately recommendations moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Councillor Green. That now closes this meeting of the Scrutiny Committee. Thanks for your attendance.